few weeks back, we saw the biggest computer outage in history, crippling critical industries like aviation, banking, retail, law enforcement. Eight and a half million Windows computers just stopped working altogether. It wasn't a cyber attack, but a regular security update. And it happened just when Microsoft desperately needed more Windows users to survive in a rapidly shrinking market. So how did the OS that once revolutionized the industry became a pale shadow of his former self? As Windows seems to be fading, macOS is quietly taken over. Could this be the beginning of the end for Windows? Microsoft today is not the company it once was. I got my first computer in 2010 and it was, well, the typical computer from that era made out of plastic with an okay screen, virtually no power, but it has the one thing that made it worth it, Windows 7 was fast, responsive, secure, and worked like a charm on any potato. And everything that came after it was questionable. Windows 8 launched in 2012 was a radical shift from everything people loved. People hated the tile-based interface, the desktop being gone, the absence of the start menu. This made people mad. And no matter how hard Microsoft tried to make it work with Windows 8.1, nothing really worked out. In 2015 came Windows 10, and it wasn't smooth sailing either. People were frustrated with the annoying update policy, the constant tracking of everything, and multiple privacy concerns. After a couple of years of fighting with Windows 10, I just switched to Mac, but kept Windows always in my peripherals. And the Windows 11 that came out a few years ago, you know, system requirements for upgrading, new design choices, and streamlining that only made things more complicated. The share of Windows computers has been falling down for years at this point. In 2013, the total share was a whopping 90%. By the end of 2023, it was at an all-time low at 62% before bouncing back to just 72% in 2024. 18% drop in 10 years. Apple's share has grown tremendously in recent years. People are choosing Macs much more often now. Even Chrome OS has much better odds than Windows. So where did it all go wrong? Every single article about the history of Microsoft always starts with Altair 8800. But actually, the true story of Microsoft starts a few years prior in 1968 with Bill Dougal. He was a high school geometry teacher at Lakeside School where Bill Gates and Paul Allen were studying. So in 1968, Bill Dougal petitioned the school to lease a teletype Model 30 computer for time sharing. Computers were really expensive back then and time sharing was the best way for students to learn programming. In 1968, only one in a million high school students had access to computers, and Bill Gates was one of them. That teletype Model 30 they had was a real piece of work. It wasn't a computer in the modern sense and acted more like an input-output terminal. It was hooked up to the General Electric mainframe terminal, so all the commands typed on it were redirected to the mainframe. Kind of like cloud computing of sorts. And that mainframe at General Electric was a real beast back then. Up to one megabyte of memory, clock speeds up to 2.5 microseconds per instruction cycle, 18-bit addressing, and this mainframe needed the whole room full of stuff to work. Makes you appreciate the modern tech. Who would have thought that it would be possible to cram a 14-core, 20-thread Intel Core i9 in a tiny box. This chip has 24 megabytes of cache and ramps up to 5.4 gigahertz. And the TDP is only 35 watts. That's nothing for the amount of power this thing has. This Geekom Mini XT13 Pro is seriously impressive. Looks super pro fesh and will fit onto any desk, that's for sure. No RGB light, no slew of buttons, only the essentials. The chip inside is great at any task and the whole assembly is super powerful. Obviously, there is no dedicated GPU here, but the integrated iGPU Intel Iris Z is really nice. With this GPU, you can easily play some of the most modern games. Yep, you heard me right. You obviously won't crank the settings to ultra, but it's gonna be a very playable experience. And as a cherry on top, you can always connect an external GPU for those gaming nights. But the most real use case for this PC is 
is something a bit more casual. Gaiman is cool and all, but no one ever talks about how hard the code compilation can be. With the amount of cores this thing has, 32 gigs of RAM and one terabyte SSD, there's plenty of power for any CPU heavy workloads. Programmers will definitely appreciate this PC because coding and compiling is very much CPU dependent. So all those cores and threads will be put to good use in apps like Visual Studio, developing apps, web design, backend, front end, this Geekcom PC can do it all. The SSD is super fast for transferring files, the speeds here are insane, and heavy files get transferred in seconds. The processor rarely even gets loaded to 100%, and the 32 gigs of RAM is more than enough for any number of Chrome tabs. I tried 20, 30, 50, no issues whatsoever. The fan inside pumps more air and the heat pipes are strategically placed to take the heat away from the most important components. It sounds too good to be true, but it really is quiet and cool. And it's modular too. So if you want to add another SSD or more RAM, you can easily do that. The XT13 Pro has plenty of power to run Windows without lags or stutters, and it always tastes cold and almost completely silent. And check out how many ports there are on the back. Two USB 4 Type-C ports, two HDMI ports, and even an Ethernet port. It also has Wi-Fi 6E, which is enough even for watching 8K videos and doing real-time VR. And with two HDMIs, I can connect two 4K monitors at once. Now I just need to get two 4K monitors. For me, this is a perfect blend of power and small size. It's compact, powerful, and upgradable. What's more to wish for? If you want an affordable PC that will let you perfect your skills at anything, the XT13 Pro is perfect for that. Thanks Geekcom for sponsoring this video. I will leave a link in the description, so be sure to check it out. 13-year-old Bill Gates, 15-year-old Paul Allen and their friend Ken Evans got fascinated with programming quickly. All they wanted to do was programming, but timesharing worked in such a way that you had to pay to use the machine. After some time, they found a way to exploit the flaw in the system to use it for free. Eventually, they got caught and banned from using the computer. But that didn't stop Bill and friends, so they started a computer club that helped companies with finding bugs in their systems. For a couple of years, the club has been operational, but friends dissolved it when they left for college and later university. And that's when 1975 and the whole Altair 8800 story happened. Paul Allen and Bill Gates read an article about this new computer and immediately contacted MITS, the developers of the computer, claiming to have a special version of basic language ready to go. At that time, they had nothing, but the company was interested. Shortly after that, in a small garage in Albuquerque, two friends founded Microsoft. As for the Altair story, Bill and Paul were writing code for the machine right until they walked through the front door of Mets. And wouldn't you know it, their Altair Basic worked perfectly on the first try, securing them a very lucrative contract. By 1978, the company had made over $1 million and in 1980 launched its first operating system, Xenix, which was a port of the Unix OS that Gates had licensed from AT&T. The same year, Microsoft created an extension card for Apple II computers, which made the majority of the company's profits that year. The companies have not always been rivals. The real breakthrough for Microsoft came in 1981, when Bill and Paul persuaded IBM to use their MS-DOS as the OS for its new IBM PC. The computer was a huge hit and finally put Microsoft on the map. MS-DOS became the most popular OS on the market, but Microsoft has licensed it not only to IBM, but to many more computer companies. The only company that rejected the offer was Apple. And just like Apple is one of the reasons for Microsoft's downfalls that we see right now, it was actually the reason why Windows became so popular and why Microsoft managed to conquer 90% of the PC market. In 1984, Apple released the Macintosh, the first consumer computer with a graphical interface. It was revolutionary for the time. No one has ever seen anything like that. No more typing commands, just point and click. Bell saw that and in 1985 released its big biggest product yet, Windows. Even though under the bonnet, Windows was just a graphical interface for MS-DOS, it gained traction. Slowly but steadily, it first became a standalone software and then the main product for the company. In 1987, Bill Gates became the world's youngest self-made billionaire. 
But his vision didn't stop there. And in 1989, after a series of company acquisitions, Microsoft managed to release Microsoft Office that we all know today. It was much more limited, but the idea was the same. Year after year, Windows has gotten better and better. Windows 95 introduced the start menu, taskbar, and the more intuitive user interface, making it more accessible. It was a massive commercial success, selling over a million copies within the first four days of its release. In many ways, this success also came from a memorable marketing campaign. The company has licensed the Start Me Up track by the Rolling Stones. And let me tell you, this ad looks great even today. Obviously, I can show it here, but here's the name for it. Not gonna lie, this gives me strong Apple vibes. I might even say it was too big of a success. The company has gotten too big and its system too widespread. So in 1998, the US Department of Justice, along with 20 states, filed a case accusing Microsoft of using anti-competitive practices to maintain its monopoly on the market. Microsoft was accused of creating an unhealthy environment for competitors by including the Microsoft Explorer as a default browser out of the box signing deals with PC manufacturers to include Explorer as a default browser. All this sounds like a fairly normal practice now. Every company has its own browser now, Safari, Edge, Chrome. The trial ended in 2000 with a proposition to break Microsoft into separate entities, effectively killing the company. Microsoft has almost died once, but the company appealed the decision and was forced to share its API with third-party companies. Around the same time, one of the founding fathers, Paul Allen, left the company board of directors. Since 1983, Paul has been suffering from Hodgkin's lymphoma, type of cancer. The treatment required aggressive therapy, which led him to step back from his day-to-day -day responsibilities at Microsoft, but he remained on board of directors and retained all stock holdings until he finally decided to leave in November 2000. Microsoft has lost a man who helped build one of the largest tech companies ever, leaving Bill the sole captain of of the ship. Without Allen's technical vision and leadership help, Gates had to adapt quickly to effectively replace his friend. But even with all these problems brewing inside Microsoft, its positions on the market remained solid. The leadership may have been falling apart, but the ship was already too big to sink. Gates and his team managed to settle the court case against the company and shortly after make a move that would change the company forever. The Windows XP. It is regarded by many to be the best Windows ever. Windows XP combined the best from all the systems that came before it, like the interface from Windows 98 and the Windows NT kernel. The system turned out to be so good that its official support has lasted for 13 years, all the way till 2014. Windows 7, launched in 2009, only solidified the success of the Windows XP, making Microsoft a true monopolist. Remember when I said that Apple helped make Microsoft Microsoft great? Well, what if I tell you that Apple is the main reason why Microsoft is losing its positions and why Windows is dying? You probably call me crazy and ask about my tinfoil hat, but hear me out. In 2007, Apple released the iPhone, revolutionary device, huge departure from everything came before it. And regardless of what journalists were saying, it was a success. I guess I don't have to tell you now how big of a success it was. You all know it already. Microsoft had been uh, making mobile-based communicators for many years by that time, but never managed to catch the eye of the general public. Their pocket PCs were clunky, had terrible screens, and were super slow. The only people buying them were office nerds. I remember my dad using one of those back in early 2000. Oh, it was a thick piece of plastic that did almost all the same things our computer did, but slower and worse. But I was only interested in games came with Jawbreaker pre-installed and I used to play it a lot. So the iPhone has shown that it's time to change and by 2010, Microsoft has released its first ever Windows phone, HTC Titan. It was a strange phone. Android was already a thing back then and this Titan was really just an Android phone with Windows installed and even though I was curious about it and even considered saving my launch money for it, the phone flopped. Despite having a fresh and new interface, the one that will serve as the basis for 
Windows 8, it had too many problems. The iPhone by 2010 already had thousands upon thousands of apps on the App Store, while Windows Phone had a fraction of that. The system was cool and had some interesting features, but was too late for an entry. It was a huge miscalculation and a mistake that the company will have to drag until 2015, when they finally decided to pull the plug on the project killing the Windows Phone OS. But if you thought that the iPhone was, you know, the only Apple product that caused Microsoft's bad decisions, you're forgetting the iPad because it had a much bigger and much deadlier impact on Windows than the iPhone. At its core, the iPad was not a new type of device. Microsoft has been making tablets for a while, but they all have been practically laptops with touchscreens, bulky with loud fans, and ran full-fledged Windows. The iPad was none of that. Even though it wasn't perfect, it only sped up the shift from computers to phones and tablets. The market was changing rapidly and Microsoft was already losing the smartphone race. So the company decided to do things differently this time around and not try to copy someone else's product. Microsoft decided to revamp the entire Windows to make it more future-proof, to better prepare it for the touchscreen future. And we all know what it meant. Tiles. The tiles that Microsoft came up with in 2010 for their phones became a part of Windows 8 in 2012. And oh boy, it was a disaster. I don't know where to start. This whole new interface called Metro was designed for touchscreens and relied on tiles instead of the traditional desktop and start menu. The decision to remove the start menu a cornerstone of Windows since its birth was also very controversial. People found the start screen unintuitive and jarring, and the presence of both regular desktop and Metro interface only added more confusion. The navigation between them was wildly inconsistent and was difficult to understand what's where and how to change things in your system. Gosh, I remember using Windows 8 when it first launched, and it was terrible. As soon as I got the chance, I installed the Windows, the good old Windows 7 back and stayed on it all the way until 2015 and the Windows 10. Even though Microsoft tried really hard to make things right and fix their mistakes, no number of updates made things better in people's eyes. Windows 8 was just too bad to exist, so only three years later, in 2015, was replaced by Windows 10. It ditched the Metro interface and went back to the classic, well-known and light layout. It was familiar, but new. Windows 8 represents the worst of Microsoft in one product. This whole approach was bad right from the start. The company was unsure about its place in the market, rapidly changing market, and tried making bold moves in hopes of becoming a big player. The whole idea was first copying successful products and when it didn't work, trying to outrun the train. None of these tactics worked. Copying more successful products killed Windows Phone and trying to be first killed Windows 8. When virtual reality became the hottest topic, Microsoft rushed to make Windows 10 more friendly for AR. The company has implemented a platform for mixed reality right into the system and also introduced a ton of 3D features to the Windows itself, like 3D Paint. Microsoft has also changed the interface of Windows 10, making it more transparent, better suited for AR and VR systems. But as we all know today, VR didn't yet become the next big thing, so all the changes that Microsoft has made had to be either scrapped or turned into built-in apps, making the system even more confusing and convoluted. Or how about foldables? When Samsung Galaxy Fold came out, it was a very interesting device that created a new category of products. Microsoft didn't want to create their own foldable at that point, but they started preparing Windows for the future, developing the new version of Windows 10 called 10X. This version was mainly focusing on optimizing everything for dual screens and eventually it was scrapped before being released to the public. But the story doesn't end there, because a few years back, Microsoft released their own foldable, Surface Duo. Every reviewer who tested it pointed out the same problems, technically inferior to competitors and with poor software. So the project once again was scrapped. 
While Microsoft was desperately trying to not lose any more ground, other companies were focusing on improving their own products. Look at Apple. For many years, they have been designing their own processors, improving their OSs, making small improvements and changes year after year to all of their products. And in 2020, the company has made a shift to ARM chips with the M1 in Max. The MacBook Air on M1 was faster than any MacBook that came before it. It was totally silent and had amazing battery life, never seen before on a laptop. I had one of those and I have only the warmest memories about it. It's an amazing laptop that still kicks ass. The shift to Apple Silicon was so successful and so well executed that it practically skyrocketed the macOS market share. And let's not forget that all of this was happening on the market that's rapidly shrinking. Even though the market is expected to start recovering soon, the trend has already been set. When Windows is in decline while macOS is rising, gaining more and more popularity. Can Microsoft really do something about it and win back its 90% market share? The company's attempt at doing that is Windows 11. And even though this version of Windows is not known for any major problems, it still struggles to dethrone Windows 10. It didn't introduce any major changes to the system, focusing mostly on removing the old junk and streamlining everything. Windows 11 is universal universally regarded as a good OS, but it has a couple flaws in its design that prevent it from becoming more widespread. For example, its hardware requirements. And I don't mean that it only runs on the most powerful chips. The problem has to do with Microsoft's focus on security. Windows 11 won't run on any chip that doesn't support TPM 2.0. TPM is a security protocol that needs to be either built into the chip itself or purchased as an extension for the motherboard. And as you might have guessed, not all processors support that, and there are no queues at stores rushing to buy the TPM extensions. This one little thing is preventing millions of people from upgrading. Because now, instead of just downloading and installing the update, they also need to spur in new tech. Another reason why Windows 11 isn't really saving the company is the lack of features. Even though the system is advertised as something radically new, it's a Windows 10 under the hood. Yes, it looks better, but it really doesn't give any new features to the regular person. I personally like Windows 11. For me, it's like this uh, almost perfect blend of macOS's design and simplicity and the freedom to do whatever I want. But where Windows 11 is really disappointing is when it comes to the little things. One, now cannot be activated unless you connect your computer to the internet first. The system is always tracking you even after you disable everything in settings. It suggests you as in the start menu. These are not the as ads, but more like badges that suggest Microsoft services and so on. These get annoying really quickly. Luckily, things are slowly changing. Or we might just be in another cycle of Microsoft launching something new. Of course, I'm talking about Windows for ARM and the push of Copilot. And that's where things get toasty. On one hand, all this shift to ARM is a good thing. The computers are getting faster, cooler, have better battery life. But at the same time, it's introducing a whole slew of problems that Microsoft isn't ready to fix. Take app support, for example. If you buy the latest Surface laptop, it's going to be ARM powered, and ARM uses a totally different set of instructions to work. The hardware itself needs different commands, so the old apps won't work, unless there is a transition layer in place that will translate the instructions for older 86 machines to the new ARM ones. Apple managed to fix this issue by launching the M1 Max and Mac OS with Rosetta 2 transition embedded into the system, and it worked shockingly well with Windows 11. Things are different here. People who tried Windows for ARM say that there is a big problem with app support. There are apps that run natively, but the number of such apps is quite small. Mostly, it's Microsoft's own apps, some Adobe apps, and a couple from third-party developers. The majority of apps run through this transition layer, but the performance is lacking. And some apps just don't work at all, like games. And even if Microsoft manages to make the transition layer more efficient, this will still not fix one simple issue, adoption. 
If people are not gonna buy ARM Windows computers, the developers aren't gonna switch to developing for ARM. For Apple, it was way easier. There are far less Macs that need upgrading their internals. <laughs> there was no way that Apple would leave any Intel-based Macs in the lineup, so developers had no choice. With Windows, this can never happen. There are far too many companies that manufacture processors, motherboards, graphics cards, and so on, and all of them will still still continue creating the hardware they are making now. And Microsoft will have to support it. So unless all hardware manufacturers switch to ARM, there will always be two versions of Windows. The flashy AI-filled Windows for ARM and the regular Windows. All this deep dive into Windows got me thinking. How can a company be so focused on moving forward, but not pay enough attention to taking care of existing systems? And that's where we should talk about the latest worldwide system crash. It might seem that the crash itself has nothing to do with the future of Windows, but that's fundamentally not true. The main culprit of the story is not Microsoft, but CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike is the company responsible for cybersecurity for big corporations. It created a firewall program that ran in Windows's kernel, and when faulty update was rolled out, it caused the blue screen of death to appear on 8.5 million computers worldwide. The main issue, however, However, was not the bug itself, but the fact that this firewall was running in the kernel. Here's why it's a big deal. There are two ways for apps to run, kernel mode and user mode. Most apps run in user mode. Games, browsers, video editors, all in user mode. When such an app crashes, the system doesn't get affected, but some apps run in the kernel, which gives them unrestricted access to memory and hardware, and when such apps crash, the system goes down too. That's exactly what happened. Typically, all kernel apps must be properly tested by Microsoft, and apparently, this time something went wrong. What this means to all of us is that for the corporate sector, there is a very high security risk now. Hackers saw that if they attack one company, they can attack pretty much everyone. The only company that wasn't affected by the strike was Southwest Airlines, and only because its systems still run Windows 3.1 from 1992. This crash can lead to two things. Enterprise customers refusing to upgrade their systems or looking for alternative software, aka developing their own proprietary systems. Recovering from that will take time and a lot of good decisions. During the court case against the FTC, Microsoft shared plans to fully move Windows to the cloud. There will be no more Windows installed on your computer, it will be yet another subscription you need to pay. There will be a bunch of computers installed in Microsoft's basement, and you'll just connect to them like you do with cloud gaming. Microsoft has already started doing this. There's a special Windows 365 system that, for now, is only available for businesses. The system streams everything from remote computers running normal Windows. The CEO of Microsoft said this. I'm so happy this is only available for businesses and enterprise customers. I hope it never rolls out to the public. Honestly, I feel like Windows has lost its way a little. From being the most loved and popular operating system in the world, came just the default OS. The competitors are pushing their solutions that solve many problems that Windows has. Mac OS, for example, is much better optimized, and the new MacBooks outperform the majority of Windows computers on the market. Linux is totally free and almost equals Windows in terms of app support, especially with all of its emulation in place. Even Chrome OS gains more and more traction. It's fast, not heavy on resources, and comes with the cheapest laptops. I remember using Windows Windows when I was a kid it was the first ever OS I ever tried, and it was the thing that got me fascinated with technology. As a kid, I saw how many things I could do on one computer, how many programs there are. It used to blow my mind. Honestly, I hope Windows makes it and survives the competition. Microsoft needs to do something about it to find the right course for Windows and stick to it. All of its competitors understand that, and this change must happen fast. As soon as possible or from being the default OS, Windows will turn into enterprise OS no one wants. What do you think? Share your opinions in the comments.